Okay, let's start this whole thing. So, Mr. Wayne, uh, introduce yourself. Just talk a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, my name is Wayne Robinson. I've, uh, I'm a master electrician. I'm a past uh, chief electrical inspector for uh, a large county in Maryland. Okay. Uh, I've, I've spent uh, the last uh, 43 years in, in code enforcement, and I've been teaching since uh, 1988. Whoa. So uh, when I first entered the uh, teaching world, I used various books from other individuals and I decided to create my own. So I do illustrated guides now, of all picture with code associated with those uh, p pictures. So um, it's worked out well. I started teaching with Capital about 10 years ago. Okay. And uh, it's worked out well. We've had a great relationship. Um, Capital is uh, aggressive. They are into training. They've got great uh, uh, training. Uh, they've got great training. Uh, what's the term? Uh, sorry. Um, they put like a high emphasis on training and well, they do a high emphasis, but they have training uh, locations that are, you know, the latest technical with the la latest technical advances associated with training. Uh, so, you know, they have revamped a lot of their rooms just for teaching. So uh, it's okay. been it's it's great in that aspect. But uh, and they haven't they'll do anything that I ask as far as trying to present something. They're very. Uh, very helpful, and we're teaching from most of the East Coast of the U.S. all the way down to Georgia. So oh, wow. we, uh, so we, we do quite a bit of training. So uh, I'm doing That's great. 270 hours or 270 days a year of training for a camp. Oh God, so I, I train quite a bit. So, uh, so but, do you travel um, to all the different locations and train, or do you have one that you kind of stick to? Well, no, I I hit uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Delaware. Virginia and Maryland, uh, North Carolina is done by uh, another instructor and down and down to Georgia. So uh, it's, um, you know, we just moved to the south uh, over the last year. It's, it's, it's been very uh, received very well. So, OK, um, but uh, I, I, uh, I my son is also training with me now. So uh, he's also a, uh, a licensed electrician. I don't know where you're from. We call them licensed electricians. So you know, uh, there's a difference between journeyman licenses. We really don't call that a license. We that, that's just meant you've met the minimum requirements to do electrical work. But uh, licensure, in order to be a licensed electrician, you have to be a master electrician. So oh, that, interesting. That's how they do it in this area. So uh, okay. I, no, I think here we just like to be an electrician, you have to be a non-apprentice. You know, like anybody that has a license, we just call that an electrician. Um, so I think licensed tends to just mean if you actually have passed the, the tests and you have your license. But um, otherwise, I think we just call somebody a master electrician, you know. License. So it's still a master in your area. They call them a master electrician. But uh, yeah. And uh, journeyman, I mean, that's I look at it as a stepping stone. I think a person should work for a journeyman prior to getting to their master's license because uh, I, I teach a lot of master courses and I always tell the guys you should do the journeyman course first. Oh, absolutely. Because the even if you, you know, you've been out of it for a long time, they go back because when you get at the master level, I expect you to know a certain amount of things. Yeah. And, and uh, unfortunately, they show up thinking that I'm going to go through the journeyman applications when we're at the master level. And I mean, we touch on them, but we don't go into an in-depth review of those applications. So, uh, yeah, I know a lot of like uh, code prep classes that are here in Texas. They teach the journeyman uh, test prep course with the masters. And then after the journeyman portion is done, they all leave and the masters have like an extra portion that they stay and do like an, an entire day after that. Um, which I still think is kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like 
in Texas, there's a new rule now with licensure, so you can't become a master unless you've had at least two years as a journeyman. So you've already had to have processed that information and passed that test. Um, so to me, I think like the master should be kind of just on its own with the understanding that you already know what it takes to be a journeyman. You shouldn't have to be retaught all of that stuff. But I understand why they do it. I mean, it's just That's funny. Uh, yeah. Two years, and we have uh, a total of seven years in Maryland. So of having to be a journeyman for seven? Total of seven years in the industry. They don't really define whether or not it's journeyman or what level you're working at. It's just seven years. And if you can prove seven years under the supervision of a master electrician, you can qualify for the exam. So Yeah, ours is the same way. So you have to have at least 12,000 hours, which ends up being six years. Uh, but for two of those years minimum, so for at least 4,000 hours, you have to be a, have been a journeyman. You can't just be an apprentice you know, for like 19 years and then just go take your master, you have to at least pass the journeyman test and operate as a, as a licensed journeyman for two years. So your prerequisite to take a master's, uh, you need to work as a journeyman as well. Yes. I mean, that's okay. So they actually track you as a journeyman before you take your master's exam in, in Texas. Yes. Uh, that's a good thing. They should do that in Maryland because we don't. So oh, it makes really? it much easier if you apply for a test if someone's already tracking you for the years that you have so you yeah. have to go to every contractor get a letter or approve through w-2s that we you know work for this organization for a certain period of time so it's uh um unfortunately it, it it's if you're not tracking or keep track of your hours then you're you're in trouble because you oh, have yeah. to go backtrack to get all your information to qualify so yeah um, and there's some guys that don't very gracefully keep on to relationships with old bosses and there's companies that go out of business and yeah so i think tracking it yourself is very a very good idea uh here in texas we have what's called a residential wireman's license as well so after your two years of apprenticeship you can apply um, you have to prove hours for that two years that you can run a residential job up to a certain amount of work but it's nothing commercial. It's still, you know, everything still has to be under a master electrician. But so there's a two year license that you can get. And then at four years, you can get your unrestricted journeyman. Um, and then at six years, you can get your master. But the whole way you have to keep applying and you have to resubmit all of the same hours that you've already submitted to the state. Um, so I know that I got my residential wireman's, then I got my journeyman's, and I just put in the new stuff that I got and sent it to them. And they're like, uh uh, we want you to resubmit every single thing. So you got to go talk to those old companies again, too. So the whole don't burn a bridge <laughs> really applies. It happens quite a bit, you know. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, matter of fact, I hear that almost every course. The guy won't talk to me. Uh, yep. I've worked for him. I left under bad conditions, and now he won't respond to me. Yeah, that's we allow that W-2. You can go in and su support your claim with W-2s if you can't get a letter and that helps. So the yeah. state will look at that. So, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Well, uh, talk about your I guess your your past in the trade. Um, where did you well, come from? Where did you start and where have you been? Well, I started in local 26. Uh, you and I had this conversation before I came up union. Uh, I went into uh, apprenticeship in 1972 okay. and uh, I had worked three years at the Senate office building uh, as a, a helper uh, in the summertime. So uh, when I got out of my time and uh, which was only a four year apprenticeship at that time, I got in my time in 76. When I was seven, 1978, I was a master electrician. So I got credit for those hours with the Senate as a helper. And so uh, I went from there uh, to business. I actually were, was in business for quite a, quite a bit of time. And I decided to uh, actually get into the inspection world. And so okay. uh, I left. It's funny because I, I was making about 50000 a year. Back and then, when I, be, when I went, this is 1978, which yeah. was good money back then. Heck yeah. And I went to an inspector, and my f wages went to $19,700 a year. Oh. So I really took it on the nose for that inspector position. Um, after time, you know, I made back that money. But when I was 55, I retired. So that's a, that's a big difference. 
So um, I still yeah. work today. I work for the Corps of Engineers, great organization. Okay. Uh, I still do inspections. Uh, besides training, I, I uh, work for them uh, daily. And uh, but so over the years, uh, I've worked probably 10 years as an inspector, went up through different levels of, you know, um, uh, to supervisor. And then from supervisor, I went to chief inspector. And I was chief inspector for probably 15 years. And then I retired at age 55. So uh, best thing I ever did because uh, um, I, I actually, when, I, when you work for a municipality, the monies aren't there. And uh, what's happening is, is that they've taken master electricians in municipalities and they've gone to ICC certifications. Yeah, let's so, talk about that a little bit. I know you got so, a lot of things to say about that. <laughs> well, I'm ICC certified, but uh, right. and they've gone to third party in this area. So they're looking at ICC certifications as the uh, at the same level as a master electrician, which it's not, because what you do is you take a correspondence course and then you take a test and then you become certified as a inspector, but you may have never done any electrical work. And just for those that don't know, correspondence means like a mail-in test. Right, you get a, you, you go, you join ICC, you get a manual and you, you know, you study the manual and then you take their test. You take it uh, at a, a PSI or one of these organizations that offer exams, uh, you go down to their uh, outlet and you take the test. Uh, if you pass it, you, if not, you pay again. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> actually, uh, PSI is the same place we do the state of Maryland master electricians uh, exam Us as too. well. So. Yeah, it's the same here. But for the IEC, there's, I, did you say IEC or ICC? ICC. Yeah, ICC. Um, so for that program, is there any sort of uh, prerequisite, any kind of thing that you have to do to even be sent that test? None that I'm aware of. Because oh. when, when I was asked to go take it, I had a master electrician's license and they would not recognize the license. Although me being hired, I had to be a master electrician at that time. Okay. Now, they don't want to pay master electrician wages, so they've gone to this ICC certification, which has lowered the wages for the inspectors. Now, in this area, some of the ICC guys make good money, okay, 80, 80 to 100000 it's not, it's not bad money, but um, back again, I went from 50 to 19.5. So it took me years to build back up to where I left, uh, which I left at a good salary. I'm not complaining, but um, it's um, it. The issue is with ICC certifications that and I think I said this to you before, when you learn the electrical trade, you learn material and methods and how code affects material and method. The way ICC works is a guy gets his, you know, he passes his exam and now he's trying to interpret the code the opposite way that we learned it. So he's looking at trying to figure out what does this mean? Uh, what's a coupling? Okay. You know, <laughs> you know, so yeah. he knows what a raceway is, we hope, you know, so He's, he's looking at issues to see if the code is applicable. So he's, learn, he's actually doing it backwards. We learned wiring methods. He's learning the code and how it applies to wiring methods, which is 180 degrees the way we learn. And, and that's just yeah. my opinion. I've got a lot of opinions. They're free. So they don't cost <laughs> uh, The older I get, the more opinions I get. So... Uh, but, well, really quick, does the, the does the ICC certification, is that a requirement by your state or anything, or is that just an extra thing you've done by choice? Well, originally I did it by choice. Well, actually, I did it because it was a 5% pay increase. And anytime someone offers you a pay increase, you are motivated to go get these certifications. But they did not recognize the master electrician's license, other than the requirement for me to be chief was either I was an engineer or I had a master electrician's license. Okay. So, but they didn't recognize it any for a uh, a field inspector. They did not. They did not recognize that. Um, 
So, but I mean, I've met a lot of guys that are good ICC inspectors, but they've spent 20 years at it. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying they don't become good inspectors, but you get a young guy who passes ICC and he's out there trying to figure out what things mean. You know. Yeah, I would think even if you had somebody that's still young that has been an electrician getting an ICC certification, they're still going to take a while before they really understand how to apply code, but at least they have a base, some sort of knowledge, whereas people without anything, I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine trying to read the code book and walking up to materials that I've never installed or seen or used. It'd be like me trying to go inspect a gas line. Like, here, just pick up this book. You know, I'm like, no way. I would never. It's like a first year apprentice. Absolutely. Just starting all over again. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, I think. Yeah. So who, uh, who runs the organization and like, do you know anything about how the organization got started and got its kind of power? Um, Actually, uh, well, I'm not sure how it got started, but Rich, actually it was BOCA and the Southern Maryland Code. And so they formed together, they formed the International Building Code, or IBC. Okay. Then they changed it to ICC. Okay. Uh, so um, it's so not, this is for you know, all They've got great trades. codes. They've got great codes. So, uh, but they also came out with their own residential code. Okay. So the International Residential Code, a lot of places in the country are enforcing that over the NFPA 70, National Electric Code. So that becomes an issue to me. So, Well, it's an, I mean, as long as, as, long as the state and the, the municipality, I guess, is, is agreeing that this is the standard that they want to, to be under, then I don't know that I necessarily see the problem with that. Like, we choose to use the NFPA because it's kind of an agreed upon thing, but... Um, it's a private company that's making codes and standards that are being adopted by municipalities. So how is this any different? Well, it's, it, the, there's a, a lot of difference in some issues when you look at the International Residential Code. You know, the thing is, again, I got an opinion on this, is that <laughs> NFPA dropped the ball and lost a lot of their codes to, like NFPA has NFPA 5000, which is the building code. I don't know anybody uses NFPA 5000. So they were late to get on board for the building code. So uh, I think California at one time adopted NFPA 5000. I don't know if they do anymore, but majority of the codes that they're enforced in municipalities are international building code. Okay. So okay. Uh, it's, it's an unfortunate, but there was a need for these codes. Yeah. So, so they now they've got all kind of codes now. I mean, they got permit specialists, and you've become a permit specialist through the ICC. Uh, so they've Whoa. got they got they've got positions for everything. So the ICC is not something just governing electrical. It's it's all trades, everything all, in building. Absolutely, you've got mm-hmm. uh, there's a there's a ma- magnitude of different, uh, I guess, disciplines for uh, the ICC. So, uh, I mean, but it, with us, it's uh, electrical general, uh, electrical residential, and then there's the plan review. So once you get all three, you become what they call plan review certified. Okay. So plan review test is, is comparable to a master electrician's exam. Okay. Uh, and I'm not saying they're not good tests, but they don't train you to be an inspector. So. You gotcha. learn as an inspector by knowing material and method because that's what you're looking at constantly. Yeah, it's basically just like a crew lead watching all of his guys work and at the end double checking everything. It's really, I think that, that feels to me the most natural way to be inspecting things. Because even so, that, like you'll have inspectors that'll look at things and they'll be like, well, I know why he did that. And it may not meet code, but it's not a life safety issue. It's not a hazard. So I'm just going to go with it because I was an electrician and I understand. I'll let that one go. Goes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't agree with that? Well, you know, like if a guy missed, uh, missed like one strap in something every six feet for a piece of MC because like structurally the building make, doesn't make sense that he could be able to do that. Like it's something one inspector might fail and say, you need to completely redo that so that you meet your strapping guidelines. And another inspector might be like, it's okay, man. I'm going to let that fly. 
I, that's kind I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. As as an electrician, you can make that judgment call on some basis that, you know, it could be that it was no place to put a strap, you know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, that, that can happen. But um, if you're only reading what it says and saying, I have to get that strap there, then yeah. maybe you're drilling the beam, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, the the issue I see mostly is services in this area. I have uh, third party inspectors that are doing services that are ICC certified, and they're fairly new to the industry. And you know, it takes a little bit of knowledge to know how to ground a service. And uh, what's happening in some municipalities, they're not allowing the ICC guys to do service work. Mm. They'll let you do rough wires, but they won't let you do a service. So you're, they're requiring master electricians to come in and do the service on the basis that they don't feel they have the competence to do that. Now, I'm, I'm okay. probably going to infuriate a lot of people, but it's a, a true statement. Uh, yeah. I know many uh, uh, organizations that do electrical inspections, and this is what I'm being told. So uh, um, it's a safety issue. So, you know, yeah. it's... Uh, Proper size wire, am I using the right table? You know, uh, so, and and uh, number six isn't the cure-all for grounding. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, yeah. uh, unfortunately, a lot of people think it is. <laughs> so, yeah, but, uh, so, you know, over the years, I started teaching because, uh, actually, I started teaching because of money. I, I made $19,500 a year, so I needed to supplement my income, so. Okay. I decided, and then it kind of grew into what I'm doing today. So uh, it's uh, actually I enjoy it, and uh, now I'm getting older. I don't think I'll be at it very much longer. So I've got my son taking over a lot of it. Uh, sharp young mind. Uh, we've got some uh, transformer courses. We've got a transformer book. I uh, got a master electrician's book, and I am going to get those books to you. I just told them that you needed copies of them. So. Uh, Okay. So, and these are all books that you've written? Yeah, yeah. It's I draw, I illustrate everything. And, That's uh, awesome. Um, and then my uh, master's book, I, I wrote that, and then my son got his hands on it and said, well, we're going to change some things. Uh, and so he's, you know, it's always good to have fresh blood or, or a fresh mind looking at something that you've been doing all your life, you know, so... Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I sent him to school to graduate from college and he turned around and went right back in electric trade. So, <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. Good man. <laughs> uh, he's a smart guy, though. So, yeah. well, I got, I, he's got a bright future in this uh, uh, industry. So, uh, that's great. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious about Texas and, and how they uh, do electrical inspections there. Is it uh, third party or does the municipality have uh, inspectors? They do. Um, so all of the municipalities around us have inspectors, unless you're like way out in the sticks or something like, you know, I'm pretty sure that exists everywhere that there's just no uh, authority that has jurisdiction in that area. So a lot of times out in those areas, permits don't even get pulled and that's just seen as OK. But a lot of businesses, homeowners will pay for a third party inspection to come in and do that. Um, and those. I'm sure are the same. Uh, it's just it's kind of a joke when it gets to the electrical portion, you got inspectors that are calling things out that they don't even understand what they're talking about. So then you got to talk to the homeowner off of a ledge being like, no, this guy's completely wrong. But as far as like the majority of, of inner city work, it's all jurisdictions. And so like we have Austin, Austin's kind of our, our big hub. So we have the city of Austin and there's a uh, chief inspector and a bunch of other, uh, inspectors that pretty much have an entire area to themselves. It's not necessarily this guy does just resi and this guy does commercial. It's just a guy that kind of owns an, an area. At least that's how I understand it. Cause I, I get a lot of the same inspectors depending on where I'm at. Um, and then and they police their area. Yeah. They police their area. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. a good thing. It's yeah, absolutely. And then you've got a lot of other little towns around us, like I'm in Leander right now, there's Leander Cedar Park, Round Rock, each one of them is their own municipality, so they've got their own inspection methods, and um, some of them are still on like the 2011 code cycle, uh, some of them are in 2014, but 
uh, most of them are on the 2017 cycle by now. Usually it's driven by the municipality, but Tommy gets through, everybody has to look at it. You know, I used to write, we used to all had supplemental codes. So, you know, what we would do if we wanted an additional codes that were more stringent, you know, we did some for swimming pools, we require a Quipotential Bonnie grid, which mm -hmm. they eliminated the 2008 code. And so we, we kept that. So uh, we kept that more stringent than the new requirement of a single wire. And um, unfortunately, uh, the last code cycle, they had a vote which put it back. And then they turned around and had a call for another vote the next day after somebody convinced the people not to go forward with it. And uh, EPRI, which did some testing, they're the utility arm of the, the testing arm of the utility, basically. And EPRI has proven the single wire method does not work. And um, most of our opposition came from Nevada. So, uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, EPRI's coming out and the utilities are going to start sending letters out telling people if you got a pool and you don't have a quick potential bonding plane in and you got stray voltage issues or you have voltage issues, we're not going to service that until you dig up your deck and put in this equipment potential bonnet plane. Wow. So it's, it's very serious. Uh, uh, actually, Boston just voted in a new requirement. Now, I understand it. I think it's been adopted, is that the equipment potential bonding plane is um, the single wire methods only approved for above ground pools. So they didn't okay. go in and address uh, in ground pools. They just said the single wire method under 680.26B, uh, I think it's B2B, uh, don't quote me on that, but I believe it is. And that, oh, that's, my my <laughs> that single, that single wire method I'm kidding, is Jackie. proven not to provide any protection. So it's, uh, it's unfortunate. So, um, I, you know, we fought this with the code panel since uh, 2008 and even had a knit man uh, submit it for that. We won the knit man, we won the four vote and they sent it back to the, the code panel and they rejected it again. So uh, um, don't get me started on knit mans because uh, to me, it's a waste of time and money. So opinion of mine, by the way. So. Do you know what the major reasoning for rejecting it was, like what the school of thought there is? Well, they don't feel that the, uh, the, the well, the reason why the single wire method went in, actually, uh, there was a guy from UL that submitted the change saying that it's always been a single wire. So your single wire, your number eight came around and hit all your ladders and your, uh, your diving board and then hit your motor but it's always was tied to your uh, wire mesh or your steel in your deck or your steel in your pool if it was a concrete pool. So that all that together formed an equipment potential bonding plane. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, when they went to fibercrete, they eliminated mesh. So all we have now is a single wire. It's not bonded to the mesh. We used to bond it to the mesh using Back in those days, they were using direct barrel split bolts. Now they've oh, wow. got a better fitting now. They've got a JRD and a, uh, it's a, uh, or rebar to number eight wire connector. Uh, so there's, there's many methods that allow you to establish that equipment tension bonding plane. But if you only have fiber creek, there's no copper grid or metal grid uh, wire mesh, you don't, you don't form the plane that protects you. So, uh, and EPRI's proven that, um, the single wire method does not provide protection. So it's kind of do scary. You have any, do you have any literature that you might be able to forward me on that? Just the EPRI findings that, that I, something just so I can read. Cause that's really interesting. I that would be great. Yeah. I, yeah. um, I've been involved in it for a long, long time. I've tried to step back from it in the last uh, code process, but there's a lot of people from a uh, Georgia Power Stray Voltage Task Group, and they are pushing through a lot of this uh, uh, 
Well, EPRI is their testing. Again, is their the arm of the utility for testing. So, uh, uh, the so it's it's I Triple E supported this. Everybody supported it except the co-panel. Two members mm -hmm. on the co-panel. So it's unfortunate that. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it begs the question why. You know. Well, it it unfortunately it's politics. If you ask me, it's in, a, in my opinion, again, I don't want to get in trouble. I just want to say that it's in my opinion that politics is driving the pool industry. Is, it has a lot of clout. And okay. uh, that's why it's that way. So it's not on safety because they've proven through testing that it's not safe. So. Interesting. That's going to that's going to lead me down a hole of digging later. And I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I try to tell people, if you're going to build a pool, put a quick touch of bonaplane in. And, and because if you do have stray voltage issues, which a lot of it's called NEV, new through the earth voltage, generated by the utility. If, if you don't have that, utility's going to say, sorry, can't help you. You didn't put a quick potential bonaplane in, and that would have taken care of the issue, even though yeah. you've got NEV. So, uh yeah, to me that uh, seems logical. I, I guess I'd never really thought about it being any other way than that. But well, <laughs> it's the way it should be. It's the way it was in 2005. Yeah. So they 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 adopted the single wire on the basis it's always been a single wire, but that's only half the truth. So, but uh, so I mean that's uh, it's it's again you've got people looking at inspections that don't really know the background. And, yeah. and uh, don't spend the time in the book. And uh, I spend, still, at, at 65 years old, I spend four or five hours a day in the book doing plan review for the core. So uh, it's, or doing inspections for the core. So, uh, yeah. Uh, it's so interesting to talk to somebody like you that has been, you said you, you started out in 76? I, well, I finished, in the, in the trade. started in 72. I actually okay. started in 68, but uh, 72 is when I went to the apprenticeship. Holy shit. So you've almost been doing this for 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Kind so, of frightening, isn't it? Oh my God. <laughs> so, so you've basically seen every, I, I guess the politics of everything. You've seen the code changes. You've seen building materials change from certain methods to other methods. Um, You've kind of seen the whole thing as a large snapshot over a half a fucking century. Oh my god! So what? What's the biggest? Like, what's the biggest thing that has changed that you've seen? And I mean, there's probably a lot of things, but like, what have you? What do you look back and wish things were the way that they were, and you see the way they are now, and it's like, God, this is silly. Well, I. I think that uh, this is, again, my opinion. I have a lot of beliefs why things have changed, but we've gone through grounding and redefined everything. This is mm -hmm. like we used to have main bonding jumper. Now we have system bonding jumper. Uh, we have supply side bonding jumper. I mean, so back in the day, 25079D of the 96 code book covered the majority of that under one article. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we've got five articles to address yeah. the same issue. So, and I think the reason why that is, is because if I'm not an electrician, now bonding jumper really is a bonding jumper, whether it's a system bonding jumper or a main bonding jumper, it's still a bonding jumper. So, yeah. uh, so we've taken and breaking, we've broken out all these different rules and, and I've broke these rules down. So trying to identify this wiring method is this, this wiring method is this, but really, and overall outlook is it's really doing the same thing. So, uh, I mean, a main bonding jumper is tying your neutral to the service, right? But a bonding jumper is providing continuity, you know, or if it's a supply side bonding jumper, it's providing uh, four separately drive systems. It's providing that uh, uh, system bonding jumper to your main service. So you're not using your neutral as a return. So, uh, so there's, um, uh, unless you're bonding at the service, okay? If you're bonding your main bonding jumper at the service, then um, uh, that becomes a whole other issue with, with uh, uh, neutral carrying objectable currents. 
on yeah. metal raceways. So, uh, which personally, I think they'll take that rule out completely. But uh, I, I have it on the project that I'm on right now. They're bonding on the load side of a, a 35 to 480 volt transformer. So they're doing it at the main service mm. and not at the transformer. But okay. the way I was taught was if you do it at the transformer, you never have to worry about anybody taking it off because it's no one's going in the cover to take that thing off. So yeah, that's 35,000 on the primary. No one's going in there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, so does so it seem like the I coats... think grounding is one of the big things that have changed quite a bit. I'm not saying it, it's a, I'm not saying it in a negative way. But we used to consolidate everything in, into one or two articles where now we're spread out all over the. And then I just think it's because people are trying to understand what wiring methods are. If, if I don't know what it is, then I've got to give you a definition for you to understand what I'm trying to talk about. So it, it take, drives me back to the ICC. And I think that's the reason why we're breaking down all these different codes uh, for people to understand. It's because so it's for the lack the of training. Inspectors. The lack of training. So, yeah, it seems it seems like uh, a lot of the terminology and why we need so many different definitions for bonding jumpers and all of that is is for the inspectors, right? I mean, the electricians don't need it. We just know, hey, let's bond this to that. Um, well, it's, it's nice like, for an electrician to know that we're all talking the same language. You know, when true. I'd say, uh, I used to say this all the time, could you take the cover off that transformer? So... I can see your system bonding jumper. Well, back then we called it a main bonding jumper. This poor system bonding jumper came out. And, uh, uh, well, what do you mean? So I'm, I'm just here to meet you. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so we ended up making sure that X out of the frame and it was, was installed. So, uh, uh, that, that was, uh, it's always been a big issue on separately drive systems. So, well, but, what's some of the what's some of the stuff that you've seen in all of that time that you think is like so good that we do now that they did not do back then? Well, safety. I can say that back when I worked in the industry, we weren't safe at all. <laughs> I've seen there pictures. was no safety training. OK, my first day on a construction site, I almost got my head taken off. Damn. I was 18 years old. And I was looking for at a lift. No one told me how to determine whether a lift was up or down. So I stuck my head over the shaft like a dummy and I almost got my head taken off. So, uh, so there was no safety protocol. You know? uh, half the time, stair, you know, elevators didn't even have um, barriers up, you know, just and uh, with 70E now and uh, we have daily safety meetings and uh, I mean, confined space training, you know, we, everything now is, is got a certification for it in order for you to do that on a particular job. That's yeah. the best thing that's happened to our industry is safety to me. Uh, okay. Because you're going to live a lot long and lockout tag out is, is one of the biggest pluses in the industry. Back in my day, we worked stuff hot all the time. I can't imagine how many times I've been knocked on my butt working stuff hot. And it was re expected of me. Yeah. You know, and uh, so those days are gone. And that's a plus for our industry. So um, I, I uh, there's a lot of things have changed. Uh, equipment's changed quite a bit. And I don't know if it's to the good or to the bad, but, you know, switchboards and what the the metal and switchboards is not what it used to be, you know. Um, but uh, uh, equipment today, uh, well, another thing is uh, variable frequency drives. That's changed quite a bit. So oh, a bit. There's there's a lot of benefit uh, and changes, uh, but I'm going to fall back on safety as being the best one. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I uh, I still see there being a giant chasm between this the responsibility for safety training being up to the company essentially, and um, there's a lot of companies out there that don't take the time to do safety meetings or anything like that. They just kind of throw some guys out in the field and they're like, "This is how we do what we do," and 
they get shocked as they go. They get hurt as they go. They're not taught how to really lift things. And I think more than ever, the kids that we have coming up now need a little bit of extra. I'm not calling kids idiots, but the generation that we're in, I feel like kids are naturally just not taught mechanical common sense and, and like job site awareness and things like that, that I think that uh, maybe people in the prior generation just kind of understood, you know, a lot of people worked on cars and they just, they got into the field and they understand mechanics. And um, I think that the upcoming generation doesn't really have that same thing. So if anything, I'm just saying, I think safety needs to be even a higher priority as these new generations come in. They need to make sure that everybody's paying attention and they're not sitting there on their phone and they understand the safety of not working on stuff live and taking risks and um, so I don't see that slowing down, basically. Well, I can tell you, the jobs I work on, we have safety protocol, and it's a good way to get kicked off the job. It's not following safety protocol. I mean, they're very serious on safety out here, on the jobs I work. Now, um, and I know that uh, both the IECs, the, which is international, uh, see, IEC is, IEC and, and if, IEC and IBEW, that's right. Uh, they both have safety training. And you know, Local 26 has extensive safety training. They make you do an OSHA 30 as part of your apprenticeship program. So, uh, oh, they make you do a 30 as an apprentice? As an that's apprentice. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's one of your electives because it's a five year program now. So, uh, okay. but safety has really come a long way in this area. Now, what happens when you're a one or, man, one or two man shop? You take risk yeah. because you're if you're a one-man shop you don't have to even have workman's comp yeah so you're you know you don't you, you, it's just the way it's established you know um so uh th then you get things become dangerous so uh but um and nobody's looking but you no no one's looking yeah. but me and and i need to get this job done and that's when things happen so mm -hmm. uh but uh, I, I'm really impressed at our safety protocols for the Corps. Corps is uh, very tough on that, and they have their own safety people. And uh, the job I'm on, we've got the contractor. Has, every sub has a safety person as well. It's, it's amazing. So uh, we didn't have that in my day. It's, uh, mm. I remember working in 480 volt gears, hot. The, guy would, the superintendent would stick his head in, is this hot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know test it i don't know what to tell you <laughs> so, yeah but yeah uh, it was a it was eye-opening for me a lot of people say oh you're in you're you're in texas y'all are a bunch of cowboys and you don't follow codes and you don't you know you do this and do that and <laughs> i've seen i've worked for places where that's absolutely true and i've worked for places that it's not at all true like they take safety with utmost importance and, and have safety meetings but um one of the things that I've always been curious about is I've never worked in the union. So here in Austin, at least, the union has a very small presence. And they, you know, there's a few companies and they pretty much do the government stuff, the big hospitals, the, the really big contracts. But there's like over a thousand electrical contractors here that are not union. So it's very much just a. a are they a, independent electrical contractors? Is that the IEC that they No, Are they just there's just no, no organization? Yeah, they're just, you just, they're just you a bunch your, of contractors that are non-union, that's all. So, Right. There are well, people with fine. the IEC that, that are in partnership with the IEC. And there's guys around here that are that have problem with that, um, problem with the union. The union guys have problem with the non-union, you know, that whole bag. But um, Well, let me just tell you, if someone's inspecting work for 50 years, <laughs> there's no difference. And I, <laughs> I'm probably going to... Thank you. I'm Thank probably going to get... Uh, beat up on that issue, but I can tell you, gives a shit. there's Everybody's good, all... there's good union work, and there's bad union work, there's good non-union work, and there's bad non-union work. So, it it just it has to deal with whether you got a conscience. That's all. Amen, brother. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you're if you're not proud of what you do, and I think this is one big issue with the young people today. If you want to be an electrician, be a good electrician. Don't yeah. just be a person that wants to run pipe all day. Learn the industry. You know, when I came out of my time, you did fire alarm, you know, you did nurse call, you did switchboards, you know, you rotated and you learned these different uh, disciplines. But today, everybody's specialized. 
I'm going, well, what does that mean? When I got out of my time, I was able to do all these things. I was trained to do them all. Now you got a guy, well, all I do is fire alarm. Yeah. All I do is data. I'm going, well, I don't understand that. I thought you were an electrician, you know? So, but it, it's becomes a specialized, uh, very much so. so. Yeah, but do you think that it has to be that way with how much technology has changed and how, you know, maybe back in, in your day, there were like a, a handful of possibilities of stuff for there to even for a guy to do. And so you kind of had to know all of them. But now, you know, like we've got so much technology that's being pushed just in solar and in wind. And we've got so much going on with alarm systems for businesses. And we've got all these different lighting control systems. And there's just so much going on that you could really just be somebody that specializes in motor controls and that is it there's so much work and there's so much diversity of material and um i see it would be hard to be one guy that knows everything in our trade anymore well you should be at least exposed to it not that oh, you're definitely. afraid at it but you know uh, like pv systems a lot of electricians when i do training they try to stay away from pv and i don't understand that you know um fire alarm uh, in my day, we used to do some systems had seven wires, seven wires at a pull station. Today, you got two wires at a pull station. You know, so it's it's really uh, become much simpler. Even though you have to be careful with your loops, it's become much simpler. Hmm. So, um, but so far alarms uh, uh, programming, I think, is probably. One of the big issues with fire alarms now, you usually got a guy come in and he, and he does nothing but the programming of the fire alarm system. But yeah. you got a guy that wires it and then you got a guy that programs it. So you got a guy that tests it. So, uh, but yes, it, the technology has made a big impact. But uh, uh, I, I don't like people to shy away from something just because they feel that it, you have hurdles, technical hurdles. And uh, so, but if you're, you should be, you should be exposed to a little bit of everything. And, and I agree. you're going to be exposed to a little bit of everything while you're working. You, gotta, you know, I'm on a job that's 900,000 uh, square feet. You'd be amazed at the, the amount of technology in, in, in this building. So, uh, um, but um, majority of the guys keening did in the box offset. So I'm going, you know, what do you mean you can't bend the box offset? He says, oh, no, we don't do that. And I'm going, well, that's why all your boxes are quarter inch, more than a quarter inch recess. So, well, we use adjustable covers for that. So, so but, mm -hmm. but the spec says you can't. So it, it's actually some of the changes have hurt us because we got lazy. So, but uh, yeah, I just think point. young people today, if they want to be an electrician, they should work, should love what you do you don't want to yeah. love what you do don't do it do something else and uh we're we get uh two or three great guys on the job and then we got a bunch of guys that are they're they're followers they're not leaders and we mm -hmm. have a lot of followers and you get a couple of good leaders on a the job they're worth their money but yeah uh, and then when you could be a follower and still make a hundred thousand a year and so, yeah you know but a leader might make 200 grand. So be an electrician. So, uh, and uh, you can't make that coming out of college. So, yeah. Unless you're no. a you know, Philadelphia attorney or something. I don't know. So. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one thing to stress. Uh, anytime I talk to anybody that, that's like debating and getting into the trade or that's new to it is just fall in love with what you're doing. If you like this a little, start trying to like it a lot. You know, and think of it as a career, not just a job where you're going to work and getting a paycheck. I mean, the stuff is cool. I mean, it's really, for me, when I get into an environment and there's things that I don't know, it's like, oh, let me do it. Let me do it. I, you know, I want to get my hands in it because it's just something new to try and it's a new challenge. And I think that just getting in the behavior of having that mindset of, of like wanting to learn new things and wanting to experience new parts of the trade that should be exciting. It shouldn't be scary. And even if it is scary kind of lean into it and, and think about everything that you do as like a new chapter or a new uh, part of your brain that you're unlocking so that you can be a better electrician. That way you're not just being stagnant and you're not the, the guy that runs Romex through holes in houses and that's all you ever do for, you know, 
but there are guys. We need guys like that too, Wayne. We need oh, guys. Oh, absolutely. That all I'm, I'm, not, I'm saying there's yeah. followers and there's leaders. I, I don't, oh yeah, you know, absolutely. It can't be a, a whole trade full of just guys that want to lead. Nobody no, ever gets shit. I, you need to take the initiative to learn. Yeah, that's absolutely. the thing. That's what I like about trying to implement journeyman licensure, because to me that's just the minimum requirement to do electrical work. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, even though there should be an apprentice license and there should be a journeyman license. The state of Maryland has not adopted journeyman licensure, but local municipalities have. There's probably seven of them in Maryland that have adopted journeyman licensure. So, uh, mm. okay. And they test for journeyman licensure. So, uh, And then if you get caught working without a license, I'll ask you to leave the county so, or that municipality. So uh, uh, that, that forces people to come to class to learn. So unfortunately, that's what you got to do. You got to force them into learning. So, yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, but uh, you know what would be an interesting conversation is you turn around and, and talk to my son because he's 30, maybe six. And uh, so he has a different look on it than I do as, as, uh, as an older person uh, and getting older by the day. Uh, so something to think about, but I, I also just to talk about different methods. A lot of people don't understand high voltage. And if you're, you know, I'm working on a 35 to 480 and you know, all your life, I've never worked over a 4160. I, now uh, I'm as an inspector, I'm getting involved in 35. So I did a 138 job once the first 138 in my uh, municipality, you know, wow. and, uh, but when you start looking at 35 and they don't do ground fault return to trip over current devices because we don't have neutrals. Mm. So they use relays. And okay. so it's, it's amazing that how these engineers have determined how, you know, they still do the short circuit current calculations and that's what they set the relays at. They, all the relays, wow. you do a coordination study and you set all your relays to that coordination study. So but it's not ground fault return. It's CT'd on every single conductor. It's amazing. Okay. It's a that whole different world when you get into high voltage work. So uh, there, that's another aspect. There's guys that do high voltage and there's guys that do, well, this is medium voltage. It's not even high voltage. Yeah. So, but uh, you gotta respect those guys that are doing the medium voltage work too. So, but. Uh, yeah, I've, but always that's, been, I've always been interested in, in trying that. Uh, getting into just working for a utility, getting into power generation stations, even doing being a lineman for a while and going out and, and doing that kind of work. Um, I watched there's videos out on YouTube of these guys that are up on the 500k, uh, you know, big Hang lines on, that are out strapped in. Yeah. Yeah. And they're up in a damn helicopter and they got that little wand and they're trying to get the helicopter at the same potential and boom, it's like, I want to do that. <laughs> I just think it would be awesome. <laughs> But yeah, you do I, hear about the helicopter getting clipping a tail every once in a while and going down because that that guy wasn't. Yeah, that's a, you know, they're, it's a Faraday cage. They strap right in. They become part of the circuit. You know, absolutely. It's a, it's a, the same issue with equipotential bonding. <laughs> so, Zing! <laughs> Get him, Wayne. Get him. <laughs> but uh, but it's um, <laughs> that's a sore point with me. But. Uh, yeah. I uh, just hate to see that uh, I was in uh, North Carolina with my family and my four-year-old, grand well, he was two-year-old grandson was getting 20 milliamps in a pool. And I had 8.7 volts on a pool deck. And because oh. he was only two years old, his resistance is very small where uh, a human being is supposed to be 500 ohms, right? Mm -hmm. But when you get a kid who's maybe a third of that, it drives up the milliamps. Yeah. And so uh, it, it, I had people in North Carolina tell me that that was due to the natural current in the earth. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, did you read your contract? I said, yeah. He said, well, it says we had natural ground current here. <laughs> well, how does that happen? The waves roll in, and it's electric motor force, and the waves roll back out, it's counter electric motor force, it induces current in the earth. He said, absolutely. 
And I said, oh, okay. I said, no, here, it's called NEV. And it's a utility issue. It could be your neighbor's issue. It could be a ground fault. That's funny that that's their explanation for it. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I, if you look at the code change I sent in the 2017, I put that whole letter in there about that, how it happened to me in North Carolina. Really? And, uh, yeah, it's in a, uh, it's, a, it's one of the code medals under 680-26B. And uh, I put the whole letter in, of what they were telling me, and I even, even uh, copied some of the uh, contract. So it shows that they have this natural ground current. But yet, uh, it, it just goes to deaf ears, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's the sad part about it, but, uh, that's but crazy. It, it's, uh, it's very weird to me, very weird to me. And we took it out of the code with no justification. No, zero well, justification. There's but a you justification. Gotta to put it back. Yeah, exactly. Very weird. So, but, uh, well, we, we're, uh, we're just over an hour, so oh. I think I know it kind of goes fast. But in the in the like, uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, my uh, my computer is going to die soon. Okay. So I think that we should wrap this up. Um, is there what? anything that you want to talk about? Share with uh, you know if you want to share like a link where people can get your book or classes that they can sign up with y'all. Yeah, my books are available through CapitalElectricEducation.com. And okay. all our courses are listed for CapitalEducation.com. Uh, so, I mean, we have, like I say, we're teaching 290 days a year. So there's something there for somebody. Uh, and, and we create courses all the time. We're coming out with a new course soon for QAQC for government work. So it's, it's just how to do quality control and quality assurance for uh, government contracts. So, uh, holy cow! How many instructors do y'all have? Excuse me. Uh, how many instructors do y'all have teaching all these classes? Uh, well, we right now uh, for the electrical portion, I think we're at three. Okay. Okay. But we have lighting, and they have other courses as well for uh, uh, lighting systems, and uh, uh, they also do seventy uh, E training. So that that's a different instructor. So okay, so probably got maybe eight different instructors for different programs. So, uh, That's a lot of courses. Electors doing a fine job and they feed you well. I told them, it doesn't <laughs> matter if you learn anything, if your belly's full, you're happy. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah. Wayne, it was really nice to talk to you. We should do one of these again and maybe uh, maybe go down the lines of a more specific path or if you think your son would, would like to do one of these i'm open to that too i'm just open I, to get i think it would be uh nice to see you look at someone younger to see his aspect on things you know or his uh, his version okay uh, yeah absolutely. i think it would be a good thing and and uh get somebody uh that's got some fresh blood in them of course i i'm not saying that i'm 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 washed up yet but uh <laughs> i've got a lot of stuff in here but to get it that's another story so uh, yeah but I, that's what I want to do. I, I like the idea of talking to people from your generation and just trying before you guys quit doing this to get everything that's in your head out so all of us young guys can benefit from it. We can learn from your mistakes and learn easier, better ways of doing things because the, the next people that are going to be in your shoes and the next people that are going to be on that code making panel are guys my age right now that are that are I hope so. filling those positions and we need – the other thing, too, is just getting into being on the code making panel. It seems like it's a lot of older guys that are, you know, they have an invitation because they're a part of a certain trade organization or something like that. But I think we need to be getting younger guys like me that I, I'm not a code professional. I know my way through code, but I don't I don't sit and study code all day long like it's my life. But I would if I was allowed to be a part of the conversation and have a seat at the table. I would love to do that. So I think we just need to generate a little bit more interest and get get the younger guys involved inspections as well i think you know yes uh, you know it's funny i belong to the eastern section of the international association of electrical inspectors i've been there for 30 some years and the same guys that were 30 years ago are the same guys doing the same thing today oh, no man, so tragic. Young blood and they were older than i when i started can you imagine these guys are you know they're probably in their 70s or 80s they're still there and they're still sitting on co-panels they it's 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 a um, unfortunately 
it's closed. Code banking is closed because you got to belong to an organization because they want to know if they got enough money to pay you to go to these different, uh, you know, they go four or five places around the country and it's a money issue. And so these organizations yeah. pay the way. So, and I but, bet they don't, I bet the premium's pretty high. <laughs> yeah, I bet it is. Oh, that's so crazy. Well, then, you know, we're just going to have a, a, an emergency, kind of like the skill gap emergency that we have and the, the numbers not coming to the trade. I think it's going to be a rough time in the next, I don't know, 15, 20 years. The trades in general, but this trade specifically, I think it's going to be really rough. We're hurting big time. It's sad. And we can't get young people because they're used to wanting to play with a phone all day. They're, they're, they, they don't have... They want to go to college, and they don't even know what they want to do when they get out of college. So it's the sad part yeah. about it. And trades, really, to me, trades been good to me. And, uh, and, and if they're interested in making money, if you're hungry, the trade's the way to go in this area. But we're yeah. still 100,000 electricians short in this area alone. So it's crazy. So Well, that's well, what I'm I don't working. want to drive you out anymore, but uh, I appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. Uh, yeah, I would like to do this earlier. So, uh, um, yeah, me too. I, I, I get up at four in the morning, so that this me too. It's pretty late for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I'm okay but, with that. Yeah. So uh, next time, maybe we'll do this earlier. So, uh, yeah. But um, I appreciate it. I'm going to get some books out to you, and always comment on me. Uh, comment on these if you feel that uh, if you ever see a mistake, I'm always willing to. Uh, and if you ever have a code issue you want to discuss, please give me a call. So, okay. I appreciate, I appreciate your it. time and your effort. Yeah, really. Yeah. Likewise. Appreciate Thank it. you so much. I'll talk Take to care, you later. man. See you.